Hello everyone, I'm Rebecca and welcome back to my sewing room. So this vlog is going to be a little bit shorter and more project focused on a single project than my usual vlogs because it's already Friday afternoon. So I have been sewing this week though. Most of the week I have been working on a super secret project that I cannot yet share with you, but I I'm almost finished with that project at this point, and that project is an 18th century something, that's your hint, and it needed a little bit more 18th century something to go along with it. So this video is all about how to create an easy, quick 18th century petticoat out of, in this case, an Ikea duvet. Now that said, of course, you can create this out of fabric and it'll actually be just slightly easier even because you won't have to do anything to finish your sides. It'll just be like a width of fabric. So we'll get to that in a moment. But for today's project, I am going to be making this out of the Hasselklocka, I believe I'm saying that right, <laughs> duvet that Ikea discontinued, unfortunately. A couple years ago. I bought this knowing that I wanted to make an 18th century outfit out of it because I love the print. I think it's just so cute and I think it's very right for 18th century and I know a lot of people have made 18th century things out of these as well. Luckily after I finished the super secret project that I'll show you in a few weeks or something like that, I still have enough of this fabric left that I can get a petticoat out of it. Now, ideally, I would want to make a petticoat with a ruffle. I don't think I'm going to have enough fabric left for the ruffle, but we'll see. So basically, this is how to make your basic plain pleated at the waist, tied on the sides petticoat that was so common in the 18th century. So let's get started. So when working with a duvet or sheets or anything that's not fabric yardage, the first thing that you have to do is determine the grain, as in which direction has a little bit of stretch to it, because if it's cotton, one direction will, and which direction doesn't, because you want the direction that has no stretch to be the length of your petticoat. So if you're working with fabric yardage, that just means it's the length of the fabric. That's how it works. And so it's a little easier if you're working with fabric yardage. But if you're working with a duvet like I am, you need to take a little section and see, okay, is this stretching? No, this one is not stretching. Is this stretching? Yes, this one is stretching. So that means that our petticoat is going to run across like this. So this section up here, or really probably the other side because this one's been cut off, but this section up here is going to be the top and or bottom of the petticoat and this section over here is going to be this side. Now, one other thing that I have already done with this, just kind of as a precursor test, was I did a small test from a scrap of fabric and I wanted to test to see if this would rip on the grain because it's so much easier to cut your pieces straight when all you have to do is rip them. So I did test this and it does rip on the grain both directions, both across the grain and with the grain. So that's what I'm going to do to start. I'm actually just going to rip on the grain. Now, if you're working with a Ikea duvet cover like I am, they have these snaps on the bottom or yeah, I guess it's the bottom of the duvet so that you can put your comforter inside. And unfortunately the snaps go all the way through the fabric and I don't know how to get them out, but probably they would leave a hole behind anyway. So we want to get rid of the snaps. And instead of cutting, I'm going to attempt to rip to get rid of the snaps. So I have already undone the seam around the snaps because they are about three eighths of an inch into past this seam. So basically I'm going to look at, okay, where is the seam on the edge over here? Because there are no snaps on the edge. Where is the seam? And go about three eighths of an inch over from there and make a small snip. And then I should hopefully just be able to rip. Let's give it a try. Satisfying sound. So now we have a great straight grain edge that is going to be 
the side of the petticoat, one of the side seams of the petticoat. So as I mentioned, I have cut off this top so it's not even. I don't think I've cut the other side. No, this side is still straight. So hopefully they cut this on the straight of green. Probably they didn't cut this on the straight of the green. <laughs> Just looking at it, I don't really think it is. So I guess it doesn't really matter which side I start with because I probably should rip it either way. I don't know if I will. I might just kind of press it and see if it trues up as a 90 degree angle with the side that we have just ripped. But basically the next step is to cut our panels. These petticoats are made with two panels and each panel, generally when I'm working with fabric yardage, each panel is the width of the fabric. So I think usually I aim for about 50 inches or so. This one, I believe I have a little bit of extra, so I might actually aim for about 60 inches. It also will depend on your waist measurement, your hip measurement, etc. My hip measurement without all of the bum roll padding and everything is 51. And so I'm probably going to go with about a 60 inch wide if I can. Since I know that I already don't have enough for a ruffle, it doesn't really matter if I go a little bit wider because I know that I won't be getting anything else out of this fabric. So again, we have determined our grain line over here. We are going with an approximate grain line for now over here and we want to measure out the width. And once we get to that width, we are going to rip again. So I've measured this across and if I go with 60 inches wide, it leaves me with like this tiny bit, this is where 60 inches is, it leaves me with this tiny bit of extra on the width up here that's like, why am I leaving that tiny bit of extra? I might as well make this two, three inches wider because otherwise I'm just wasting more scraps right over here. So I think that is what I'm going to do. I don't think it cuts in anywhere. Again, it's a little easier if you're using fabric yardage because you're already going to have just straight panels. But with the duvet, it's a little bit more challenging to see like, okay, well, where are all my weird cut edges? What do I do with that? And so I'm just gonna go a little bit wider so that it lines up with this cut piece right here since this is the farthest that it cuts in. And Go with that so i think that's going to be like about 62 63 across and then i'm going to rip that panel again the other thing at this point before we rip is that we do want to kind of determine the length of what we're looking for so i'm going for kind of an ankle length of my skirt and i do have to keep in mind though that it is going to go over a bum pad so you need to make sure when you're doing your hem Really, I should be putting on the bum pad, putting on a petticoat, and doing it that way. By the way, just to clear up any confusion for those of you who may not be as familiar with 18th century, petticoats can mean both under petticoats, things that you don't see, kind of like in the Victorian era, petticoats are things you don't see. But in the 18th century, petticoats also are skirts. So the outer skirt that you wear in the 18th century, that is also called a petticoat as long as it is separate from a bodice. So anything, like if you're wearing a gown, then that's just the skirts of your gown. But what shows in front, if you have one that's open in the front, that is your petticoat. So, little tidbit for you, just in case you are not familiar with 18th century terminology. So anyway, instead of putting my stays on and everything like that, because that's a hassle and I don't want to, I'm going to do an approximate measuring of just measuring over this and I might throw on a petticoat and just to take that measurement there and again I want this kind of to the low ankle because then I can turn up a hem and have it about ankle length so kind of just below the ankle is what I'm aiming for okay so I actually cheated a little bit I went and I put the bum pad on and I put on my quilted petticoat which is most likely what I'll be wearing underneath this petticoat particularly if I wear this anytime during the winter because my quilted petticoat is super nice and warm. And then I realized like, well, the quilted petticoat is just a little bit shorter than where I want it. So if I basically cut this so that it can be about one to one and a half inches longer than my quilted petticoat, then it would be the perfect length. So that's what I did. I then took off my quilted petticoat instead of having to measure, you know, while I'm wearing it and everything, and figure out, oh, well, this is how much more I need for the bum pad and all of that sort of whatever. 
I just went and took the quilted petticoat and measured it and then added a little bit of extra length to it. So if you do already have a petticoat, that's great. If not, you will have to measure over what you're wearing. So I would recommend, you know, putting on your bum pad for sure. You absolutely need your bum pad on. Don't do this without your bum pad. Make your bum pad first. But I feel like you don't really have to put on your stays. Just measure from your natural waist and it shouldn't be that far off and measure over your bum pad in the back and then measure just, you know, there's no bum pad in the front. So just measure the front length of what you want. So I determined that I need for both panels together, I need 92 inches total. So I have gone down the side that we ripped on the straight of the grain and marked a spot 92 inches down. There it is. <laughs> I marked my spot 92 inches down and what I'm actually going to do next is I'm going to rip across the grain on that spot because that will allow me this much left to potentially make ruffles out of. It is not enough to make ruffles around the entire skirt so that's a little bit of a problem. I still need more fabric but it's at least a start so we'll see. So I'm going to make a little snip on my mark and rip across. I'm not going to quite rip all the way across because now we can go ahead and rip on our other mark on the top, which is right here and rip down that way. And that might leave me a little bit of excess down here we shall see. And if I run into any cut sides, I am going to have to start the rip over. And basically we want our rip pieces to match up. So I'm going to keep ripping this one a little bit more. Then I'm going to go back to the one that we were just working on and rip that a little bit more because we want them to meet so that we don't waste any. Oh, we're close. Ha ha. And then if you have extra strings like this, just cut them. But now we can get rid of our little bit of excess that maybe I can make some ruffles out of. And we have panels that three sides we know are completely on the grain. We have not ripped that side that was the top, but I'm not going to worry about that yet. I am going to take the two measurements that I took from back and then also the front and what I need. And I'm going to mark down from the side that we did just rip, I'm going to mark down the length and find out where that needs to stop. Okay, so I should have trued off the grain on that top piece too. I didn't think it would be as far off as it actually is, but luckily I did something that I highly recommend if you haven't already trued it off. And that is not only did I measure to the point halfway, like where one panel would end, but I measured the other half of it to see if that was the correct amount for the other panel. And basically I was looking for a 44 and a half inch panel and a 47 and a half inch panel. And so I measured my 44 and a half, marked my mark, and then measured the other side on one side, obviously not the side that I measured from the first place, because it was 46 inches long. So Ikea's manufacturing was so far off grain, they were an inch and a half off grain. Great. So unfortunately my petticoat's going to be a little bit shorter and or have a very narrow hem than what I had wanted. So I will have to figure out, I'm going to take 0.75 inches off of each of them because that will balance out the inch and a half that I'm short. So basically I'm going to have, instead of 44 and a half and 47 and a half, I'm going to have 43 and three quarters and 46 and three quarters. So now I'm going to go and mark them again and then I will rip down the width of the fabric for that length measurement. Okay, I've marked my new measurements and I also took off enough that I can rip 
on the grain down here at the bottom. One thing that you can't do is you can't rip from like nothing. So either I can use this quarter inch, which I think is still going to be too narrow to rip here or on the other side, I will have to start there and rip from the other side so that I can get that all flat. But first let's go ahead and rip this middle one. Okay. This is going to be our front panel. It's the shorter panel and this is going to be the back. Now, I know that you're probably thinking right now, but the two panels aren't going to match up on the side. And I'm here to tell you, I don't care. <laughs> really, we need that extra length over the back, not really right at the sides. So at the sides, it's still going to be the shorter length of the front, and then the back is going to get gradually longer. Now, in the 18th century method, they would true up that hem by raising and lowering at the waist. And I say to them, no, I don't want to do that. So I am just going to true it up on the sides. Once I put those two seams together, I'm going to cut off the excess in just a little bit of a slope so that when I wear it over the mum pad, it looks even at the bottom. That's just what I do. I know it's not the historically accurate method and I don't care. Oh, I, maybe I should have mentioned it. This isn't going to be a historically accurate tutorial. I'm going to serge things. I'm going to sew things with my sewing machine. I'm going to use bias tape at the top of the waistband. So yeah, this isn't historically accurate. If you're looking for that, I guess you should go to another video. Okay, I'm going to go true up that last side now. So to do that, I am measuring the longer of the sides here, and I'm measuring it to the 46 and 3 quarters mark, which is right here. And I mean, I guess I could have just kind of estimated one and a half inches up from the bottom, but I just feel safer this way. And then I am going to snip that and even out that side that Ikea really screwed up. It can be harder to even things out when there's not much there, but I think we'll get all the way across. Ha ha! There we go. Okay, now we have two panels, front and back, and this is the back panel. So now we have to press all of these sides that we ripped. When you rip things, they get a little wonky sometimes. This one actually seems to have held up really nicely. It doesn't feel like it got pulled off grain. Some fabrics can get a little pulled off. Like if you rip um, cotton organdy, that can get a little bit pulled off, but this is just a nicer lightweight cotton. So it seems like it's handled it really super well. So I'm going to press those and then I'm going to serge all of my edges. If you don't have a serger, you can go ahead and finish all of this with your sewing machine. You could do a zigzag stitch over the edge or some machines have an overcasting stitch and you can use either of those on your edges. Or if you really just want to take that extra time, don't finish your edges now. After we put your seams together, you can fell your seams by hand. You do you. So I have now searched around three sides of each of the two pieces. I did not search around the fourth side because it is the hem. And as I mentioned, we are going to level off that hem on the sides of the back piece. So I figured we really don't need to search it. Plus, honestly, this is going to be such a quick project that the hem's not really going to have time to fray before we hem it anyway. So Therefore, we don't really need to worry about it. If I notice that it starts to fray, then I will serge it, but I will wait until after I have put my two pieces together to do so. Speaking of which, it's time to put our two pieces together. So I'm going to put right sides together on these two pieces. You are not going to sew up the entire side seam though. You're gonna leave about nine or 10 inches at the top unsewn. So it's your comfort level, you know, for how much you want to leave, but I'd say like about this much, which I think is nine or so inches. And that is because on 18th century skirts, you basically have your back piece on one tied band and your front piece on another tied. We are going to use bias tape just 
pre-made purchase from the store bias tape as our ties. And so we are basically, you're going to have a, an opening here and your skirts are going to overlap. So normally I tie the back first and I will tie that and then put the front on and tie that. And you want it to overlap just a tiny bit, but not a lot because if it's a lot, you can't find your pockets and pockets are important. So that's what those slits are for. They are your pocket slits and they also help you get into the skirt. So let's go ahead and sew these together. My front and back are sewn together and I have pressed the seam. So now it is time to start on the pleating. I know we're already at pleating. And to do that, you are going to want to find the center point of both front and back. So just fold your pieces in half and mark that. I would recommend marking this both with a pen and also sticking a large pin through it and kind of going back and forth multiple times because you don't want to lose this step and you will probably lose it if it's just marked with a friction pen because you are going to be pressing your pleats. So do something that you won't lose this on, but at the same time, like, don't mark it with a permanent pen or something like that. I suppose you could if it's in the seam allowance, as in just the very top of it, but that gets a little scary. You're going to do this for both front and back. Now, aesthetically speaking, I like my pleats to have sort of almost like a large box pleat as in exterior, interior, I, I don't know, large flat section in the very front of the skirt. So uh, at least about like five inches wide or so. And then I like to pleat towards the back from there, ending in the center back with, a, I think they call it an inverted box pleat, the kind where it's the two folds coming over and then the flat underneath in back. So sorry for my terminology, but that is just what I like. I prefer all the pleats to face around to the back and to be flat in the front. I don't know for sure whether this is the historically accurate method, but I just think it looks so much better. So that is what I'm going to do on this. And that means that after finding that center of the front, you are going to mark out two, three inches on each side so that you know where the pleats are going to start. Now we know where to start pleating. I eyeball my pleats. So I know that each quadrant should be approximately 10 inches total because my waist is a little bit smaller than 40 inches in my stays. So we are going to pleat all of these down so that each quadrant will equal 10 inches. And I do this one quadrant at a time. So I will do one half of the front and then I'll match the other half of the front to the first half and then likewise I'll do the same thing on the back and match the other half of the back to the first half of the back. I tend to like to do shallower pleats towards the center and wider pleats as it gets farther out to the side. Over here at the side seams, I will fold down the seam allowance and sometimes fold it again. You can also stitch it if it doesn't really feel like it's gonna stay in place. But you can either just fold it or you can tuck in the little bitty fold so that no serge slush edges are showing. I'm going to skip to doing a couple of pleats over here because I want the last pleat to be on even with this. Now, when you eyeball, yes, it is much easier and faster to pleat initially, but of course, it's highly unlikely that I'm going to pleat this exactly to 10 inches because that would be magic. If I do, amazing. If I don't, what I will then do is adjust some of the pleats. This may not be the best method for like silk that's really gonna show that crease no matter what you do, but for cotton you can repleat and it's okay. So like right now I've got a weird wide space here and also I'm over, but only by an inch and a quarter. 
And that's really because of the white space. So we're just going to adjust that. Let's see how we're doing. Ten inches. See, it's not rocket science, it's eyeballing. Now, this part's a little bit harder because we are going to match up these pleats to the other side because we do want the two to look the same. So to do that, I recommend folding at your center point. I want to fold this so that the right sides are together. That will make this easier because that is how the pleats are, the direction that the pleats are going. So now our pleats are all going that way. I'm actually going to remove my center front pin now because it's kind of just getting in the way now that we know where this goes. And I like to, as I go, stick a pin through all of the layers so that I know that it's kind of holding in place as I go. You can see how much easier this is in the air because I can just line this up against a pleat, fold this back to match the other side of the pleat. And pin that pleat in place. Making sure not to go through all of the layers when you are pinning the pleats. I will pin through the layers every three or four pleats. It probably will help if when you pin through all of the layers, you use a different color pin so that you know which pins to take out and which pins to leave in so that you can sew on those pins. And again, when we get to this side, we need to press this back. So before I take any of the pins that are going through all the layers out, I'm just going to press that. By doing that, I have a basic press of where those need to go. Now I can take out the pins that are holding the two layers together. And we have our fronts fully pleated. I just need to turn in the seam allowance on this side. Ta -da! Now let's do the same thing on the back. So just eyeballing this back, I have pleated this up too small, and I think that's because of how deep that I made the pleats over here towards the center. Yeah, way too small. Uh, we're about an inch and a half too small on this one. So I need to loosen some of these pleats a bit and gain back that inch and a half. And it's around here that my pleats start to get deeper, but here's where they're super deep. They're like double the depth of the ones over here. So I'm going to start by just kind of opening up these a little bit because basically I should be gaining one full pleat extra because my pleats are, I think, about three quarters to an inch wide. Yeah, inch. That one's a tiny bit more than an inch. I'll have to make my pleats just a little bit more than an inch because I'm looking for an inch and a half. So I can't just like add in one more because I still won't be at the right section. So like some of these that are a little bit narrower, this is like a th seven eighths. Um, I will probably release these a little bit and make some just a little bit more than an inch as well. Ten inches exactly. Perfect. And I did that just by releasing some of the pleats. By the way, don't iron on your pins unless you have glass head pins or you will wind up with melted plastic all over your project. Please go get yourself some glass head pins if you don't already have those. These are great for like super bulky stuff, but otherwise you really want these glass head pins. 
Now we're going to match up the other side like we did the first time, except this time, because of the directions the pleats are going, we are going to make it fold so that the wrong sides are in because we want to go the direction of the pleats. Now that we have pinned and pressed all of our pleats into place on both the front and the back, we can go ahead and stitch that all down. I would recommend that you measure across the top of each side just to make sure that it is half of the measurement that you're going for. I have not done that yet, so I will do that before basting these all in place, and yes, basting with the sewing machine. Well, I thought that I would be able to finish this project all within the course of like a couple hours, but I just went to pull out my bias tape because the next step after basting your pleats down is to do your bias tape waistband. And for that, you need ideally like that wide double fold where it's, you know, folded twice and therefore it looks like half an inch wide. And um, this is the extent of any wide white bias tape that I have left. So since I don't want to go through the annoyance of making my own bias, I have to run off to Joanne's and get more of this and hope that I don't come home with any new projects because it's a habit that I've been having at Joanne's. Uh, so just to really quickly talk about how much bias tape you're going to need for this project, I have my quilted petticoat here which this, by the way, is just made out of like that matelas, matelas fabric that you can get from Joann's the, in the home deck section. And it's great. It's warm. It's thick. It's so nice. So basically you could do this two ways, which with two different lengths of bias tape. The way that I prefer to do it is from the back, you have enough bias to go over the top of your skirt. And then on top of that, you have enough to come around to the front of your waist and tie in a little bow. On the front, on the other hand, you have the top of the skirt plus around the back plus around the front again and then tie into the bow and that just means that you don't have to be tying bows in the back and like tucking them in and I don't know you can do that if you want but it's easy enough just to do it this way so that means that for the front We are talking about 57 and a half times two. So 114 inches, 115 inches of bias tape. And for the back, that is uh, exactly two yards of bias tape. Well, just a little bit over because you do want to fold in the ends. So basically two yards in the front and two plus yards to three yards in the back. So I need to make, get two packs is what that means. I haven't done 18th century stuff in a long time. So I have made a whole bunch of these petticoats, but it's been like five years. So I'm going to run off to Joann's and really hope that they have two packs of white double fold bias tape. And I will be back to show you how to put that on. I have returned with my extra wide double fold bias tape and also fabric for three additional projects. Whoops. To be fair, one of the projects was actually already planned, so it's totally okay that I bought that because I went in with the intention of looking for that project, and that is that I'm going to be making myself a Christmas dress. The other ones, one will go into stash, and then the other one is something skirt also for Christmas. So smallish projects and something for stash, which I usually don't do, but it was $4 a yard, and it was couldn't pass it up. I'll show it to you guys later, but I think that I will pop all of that into next week's video as I start a new project and not just this quick 18th century petticoat project. So next week I will go through like all of my upcoming projects that I'm working on in the next couple of months with you. Take a look at the whiteboard and all of that good stuff. But you are here for the 18th century petticoat. So the next thing that we have to do is figure out how much bias tape we want for the waistbands. Now I'm using that quilted petticoat that I already showed you to know how much I want on each one. So I do kind of get to cheat. Uh, if you have approximately a 40 inch waist, you might want to use the exact same measurements. If you have a smaller waist, use less. If you have a larger waist, use more. <laughs> 
let's go ahead and grab those measurements off and then basically once you have that piece cut of that piece of your bias tape cut all you have to do is mark the center of that and line it up with the center of your skirt so that's what we're gonna do so the back tie binding is 72 inches, two yards. And what I didn't realize until just now is that these are actually sold in three yard packs, not four yard packs like the single fold. So you will need two yards almost no matter what, because the front ties actually by tying them around back to the front again, I need the entire package. And in fact, I think that mine has maybe stretched a little bit over time. It is bias tape, so that makes sense. And because my front ties are actually longer than three yards of bias tape, not by much, but by a few inches. So we're just going to use the whole three yards for the front. I have already marked the midway point on the back and I'm about to mark it on the front as well. And then we just match up and sew. So on one side, you are going to do right sides together so that you have the binding on the front right side of the petticoat. We're going to do straight stitch to stitch that together. Once you've stitched that, when we flip it over, we're not going to do a straight stitch. We're actually going to do a zigzag stitch. So let's go ahead and get to stitching. I'm starting by pinning the bias binding in place on with right sides together on the petticoat and I'm looking at the front side right here. Now when you look at double fold bias there is kind of a short side and a long side. You can see the difference. So I am making sure that the short side is what unfolds and goes against the right side of the fabric and that is because that way it's easier to stitch down the other side. Uh, particularly true if you're doing a straight stitch. We're doing a zigzag so it's less necessary but still a good tip and I'm just going to pin this in place every few inches along the front of our pleats and just over the pleats. I don't worry about any of the tape past the pleats. I did match up the center to begin with and then I'm just going to wherever it stops on here and not measuring anything. Now that this is pinned, we are just going to stitch in the crease line right here, this one right here. We're just gonna stitch right along that. And once that's done, we'll be able to fold it over and do our zigzagging. All right, I have sewn that straight stitch seam and now I want to press this up and into place. This is what it's going to look like at the top of your petticoat. So just nice, narrow, low profile, just bias. And it really doesn't stretch because it's got the fabric in it. So the ties can stretch a little bit, but you know what, it's okay. But that is why we're going to use a zigzag stitch on them because otherwise if the tie were to stretch, it would pop the straight stitches. So before we get there, we do have one other thing to press besides this seam. And that is that we need to press in the end of the bias tape so that there are no raw edges. Just press in all four ends on your ties. Now that everything is pressed in place, we are going to do a zigzag stitch. On the strap part, on the tie part, you're just going to do the zigzag kind of as close to the bottom as you can. Over on this part, I usually like to overlap the point of the zigzag by just the tiniest, tiniest bit so that basically just the point is past the end of the bias tape. That's entirely up to you though. And you can use either a contrast thread or the same color. I'm going to use the same color, AKA white. So I have switched over to my other machine because zigzags were not working on my normal machine there in the back. And I really need to get it serviced. Uh, and I realized that I was not being specific enough when I was talking about zigzags before. What I meant was this stitch right here. So not your standard zigzag, which on this machine is number five, but it's the zigzag that takes multiple stitches per zig. So on here, it's number four. I'm not sure what this is actually called, but this is the zigzag. So what this does is that, taking multiple stitches. It's a little nerve wracking to put this through the machine one handed, but that is what you're looking at, not a standard zigzag. So I'm going to go ahead and keep zigzagging on here because it does take a little while just because the uh, binding is so long and I will show you what that looks like when it is done. So this is what that stitching looks like when it is all said and done on the binding and the ties look like this. 
And now we can do the hem. Now, normally I would recommend, uh, you know, like putting on your stays and checking the hem and all of that sort of thing like this, but I don't feel like putting on my stays. So I'm not gonna do that. Um, so instead I am going to put it on my dress form and first I'm going to like level the pieces out where the side seams don't meet because I know that I don't need that so I'm just going to kind of gently curve that but then I'm going to put it on the dress form see if it looks okay and if it looks okay I'm just going to press up a narrow hem and so that that I am going to do by hand though because I don't know that I'm going to be able to get fabric for a ruffle and so probably the hem will show and therefore I need a hand hem. So let me go ahead, level out those sides and stick it on the dress form and we'll see what it looks like. So here's looking at the hem. It looks like it is a pretty good length in the front. I'm liking what that looks like. It's a touch short right on the sides and that is because I forgot to account for the fact that when you are looking at the 18th century, some of the padding has already started by the sides. So <laughs> that's why it's a little bit short here. I should have cut the front actually longer and then shortened the center front, but that is okay. And then I did cut away the sides so that they match up here at the side seam, but I've done it too steeply. So you can really see the change very quickly from the side here to even like right here. So I'm going to have to level that out a little bit more so that it goes to like maybe back here. And then I can figure out, you know, how much I need to shorten it. I think it's actually a pretty darn good length. I do, I'm pretty sure, wind up having a larger bum than this lady here, Lady Jane. But <laughs> so that is something to keep in mind that this will actually probably sit a little bit higher on me than it does on her. But overall, I think it's looking pretty good. I'm just going to level out that bit. And when I turn up the narrow hem, I'm going to make it as narrow as possible right here at the sides, whereas in the front and in the back, I can make it just slightly wider than narrow. Uh, the other thing that I'm a little bit nervous about right here is that right now on my side seam, I am actually exactly the length of my quilted petticoat. So in other words, by turning it up at all, which I obviously have to do, I am going to see a tiny bit of petticoat, which is unfortunate, but hopefully I can find fabric for the ruffle because that's what I really want. I want a ruffle on here. And if I do find fabric for the ruffle, I will come back and show you how to add a ruffle to an 18th century petticoat. But anyway, I am going to even this out just a little bit and sew this by hand. And I will come back and show you what the whole thing looks like when it's finished. It won't look much different than this. It'll just have a hem this just in. I might be able to make it work with the yardage that I have. I know, it's big news. So I looked at all of the rest of my scraps and basically I have two lengths of basically the width of the fabric, like 63 inches. And I think that was because it was cut off of the bottom of the width. That was what we didn't need. And there's enough that I can get two lengths of ruffles out of that. And then if I don't pay attention to grain, which in this case I d can't, not if I want to do this, then the piece that was on the side of where we cut out the panels is also wide enough for two more ruffles. It's only, I think that one is about 43 inches long as opposed to like 63 inches long, but that means that I will have enough that I can have like 1.75 times the width of the skirt. Now normally for a ruffle I would prefer to have like two or even three times as much. So this might not work. I still might need more but I think I'm gonna cut those strips out and put them together and just see what they look like when they're gathered because a limp ruffle might be better than no ruffle at all. Maybe? So okay I am going to try to do that. Try to put those things together and just see if they make up a ruffle. Okay, so I was able to cut five pieces. They are nine and a half inches tall and they range in size. Two are approximately like 63 inches long, two are like 43 inches long, and one is like 24 inches long. So now I'm going to, I've surged the edges here so that they don't fray. I am going to seam all of their short edges together so that they're one long circle. And then before I do any of the dagging, which I'm going to do with my pinking shears, I am going to 
gather them up first because that will give me a straight edge here to gather them up so that I can like run a gathering stitch maybe about here ish I think what is that like inch and a half two inches down from the top and gather all of that up but before I pull the gathering stitches and uh, then I'm going to dag it so that should be easier I will show you what I mean by dagging in a few so I've pieced them together and noted the two midway points and basically started and stopped my gathering stitches at one of the midway points. And that way I can put these two points aligned with the side seams of the dress when I do gather it up. First, I wanted to show you what I'm doing with the dagging though. And I want these to be fairly shallow because I don't want them like kind of flopping all over the place. So I'm just going in with my pinking shears and doing kind of dags that are like about a half inch deep and I don't know I guess it's about an inch wide just eyeballing this because it's going to get all gathered up and not be super visible anyway if I get to a point like this one where I didn't actually cut it off I can get it with my little snips but just kind of going in there with the shears now this takes for freaking ever but it does look really nice so this is something that I am going to do most of probably later, but I do want to do particularly the top part of this because I'm going to do this to the hem as well. I want to do the top part before I gather up these threads because otherwise it's going to be much more difficult to cut it when it's not like a flat surface. So I'm going to get working on these and... I will check in later when these are all done. Obviously, if you are just doing this petticoat without a ruffle, without dags on your ruffle, etc., this is gonna be like a way easier petticoat. I have made this more complicated by doing this ruffle, but I really like the look of it. The funny thing is that one of my, my main inspiration, I should say, which is a jacket and skirt from the Williamsburg like collection, and I will link that below. But that one does have a petticoat with a ruffle. And I have seen other dresses that are, you know, pretty famous, like that gorgeous purple and white stripe one or what have you. And they all have petticoats with ruffles too. And so I kind of got it in my mind that I really wanted a petticoat with a ruffle. And then of course I was doing more research tonight just to see, oh, well, were they pinked? Were they, what, what was going on up there? And most of the ones that I was coming across, this was after I decided I was doing the ruffle, most of the ones that I was coming across didn't have ruffles at all. So you don't need to do this. This is probably silly of me to even do, but I like ruffles, so. I'm doing ruffles, even though this will make this take more than just, you know, the evening. That was my goal, to do this whole petticoat just this evening. I started mm, late afternoon today, and it is now nighttime, and I've done other things, including going to Joanne's and dinner and walking my dog and all of that sort of thing in this whole time. But... I have turned this into a significantly longer project by doing this ruffle. So if you want to make things easy on yourself, don't do a ruffle on your petticoat. But if you want to make things floofy and more time consuming, put a ruffle on your petticoat like I am. Anyway, I'm gonna keep going on this. This is not hand friendly by the way either. So if you have hand issues, do not do this. Like don't, you will regret it completely because these scissors are pretty rough on your hands. Luckily, I don't have hand issues. I might by the time I finish this, but I don't normally. So I am gonna keep going and I will check in with you when all of this is done. So I decided that I could not just cheat and not put on my stays and actually like look at the hem on myself. I needed to do that because when I was having it on the dress form, the quilted petticoat was showing at the bottom after I pinned up the hem and I don't want it to show. I like the length of the quilted petticoat. That's the length that I want this skirt to be. And I wasn't sure if that was just a thing of like it being on the dress form together and that's why it wasn't working right or whatever or if it was actually not right so I determined that I needed to put on my stays and 
then like try on the petticoat. So I have everything on now. And this is what we are looking at right now. So as you can maybe see, I don't know if you can quite see because the lighting is terrible, but my quilted petticoat is totally showing at the bottom way a ton on the sides. Like it's showing at least over an inch on the sides. And actually it's showing just the tiniest bit on the front as well. Zoom in there. So it's showing just a tiny bit, like less than a half inch on the front as well. So what that means is that I'm actually going to set the ruffle on to hide that. So the back is just fine right now. It's not showing in the back. If anything, the back might even be just a touch long, but it's way short on the sides and it's tiny bit short in the front. And you know what? Sometimes life happens and you mess up. So don't be like me. Don't cut your petticoat front side front panel to the length of just what you need in the center front cut it to the length of what you need at the side please learn from my mistake and don't have this happen to you but luckily I did get that ruffle put together so that needs to go on that means that I'm actually going to sew this by machine this hem by machine so that'll save me a little bit of time and I will put the ruffle on so that the ruffle will be even at the back in the center it'll be even with the hem and then at the sides it will actually hang down below the hem and that is what I'm determining to fix this so I'm gonna go ahead and hem this put the ruffle on and check back in with you so to put the ruffle on what I'm doing is I have divided both the ruffle and the bottom of the skirt into eighths and I had kind of already the front and the, and the back, center back of the ruffle and the skirt marked, and then I've gone through and divided from there, finding each eighth quadrant of the skirt, and I'm matching them up and pinning them into place. Now that everything has been pinned into place as far as like every eighth, well, okay, all but one has been pinned into place as far as every eighth goes, then I can go ahead and pull up the gathering stitches. These are just long running stitches that I did on the machine and I'm going to pull them up and basically it will fit the ruffle section into place on the skirt and then I'll put in additional pins every few inches so that everything looks right and then I'm going to try it on again to make sure that it is all sitting quite nicely. So I will show you what that looks like once it is on. Okay, this has been a pain in the butt of a ruffle, but I think it is basically even. It definitely does feel a little bit lower in the back, but it's, I don't know, at this point, I'm just sick of it. So I'm going to stick with it as is and just sew it in place. I'm gonna sew it on the machine, just using a straight stitch over my two lines of gathering or kind of in between the two lines of gathering and just stitch it all down. So this is what it looks like and I will show you what it looks like as soon as it, the ruffle is on, which will mean that the petticoat is done. And actually it wound up being a pretty nice full ruffle. So definitely happy about that. It's done. Look at that awesome, lovely ruffle. I think it turned out just right. I love all of the little dagged edges on here with all the pinking shears and everything. It was worth the fact that my thumb is now bruised. Again, wasn't kidding when I said don't do this if you have hand problems, but I really like how it turned out. I think it is just perfect. And I mean, other than adding the ruffle, it was really a very simple project. I just made it way harder on myself. So super excited to be able to wear this. So I am very excited that that project is complete. By adding the ruffle, it did take longer than just one evening. If I had not done the ruffle, then this whole thing would have been done in just a few hours. So it really is a nice, super quick and easy project. And if you are using fabric instead of a duvet cover, it's actually even easier because you don't have to do all that ribbing on the straight of grain that we did at the beginning of this project. So I'm very excited to be able to wear this 18th century petticoat. You're not going to be seeing any pictures or videos of me wearing it finished though yet because I am still working on the super secret project that goes on top. And also I'm kind of thinking that I want to be doing some accessories for this. So they won't happen right away, but maybe in December, I'm thinking that I want to make an apron 
and one of those caps, like the ones that are called modern speaking wise, they're called the market bonnets. I know that they weren't actually called that, but I think I want to make one of those. So, and maybe a fichu or some other small millinery items to go along with it. I just love kind of like the printed cotton look and I have a few paintings and fashion plates and stuff that I have saved in my Pinterest that I've been looking at for a couple years since wanting to start this project. And they're very like peasanty, country chic, etc. And they all kind of have that like market bonnet look and the multicolored aprons and stuff. So I think that is something that I'm going to be working on more accessories for. And I will show you a completely finished video when all of that is done and do videos on those individual projects as well once they come up. But again, that probably won't be until at least mid-December, maybe even not until 2021. But I do hope that you enjoyed this video and that you found it maybe helpful. If you are planning to make an 18th century petticoat out of an Ikea duvet, please do let me know. And likewise, if you're working on any other 18th century projects or have any coming up, let me know that too. Just leave me a comment down below. So anyway, I do hope you enjoyed this video. If you liked this video, please make sure to click the thumbs up icon. And if you'd like to see more videos like this from me, please go ahead and click subscribe and the little bell icon to be notified every time I post a video. I do post videos here on YouTube twice a week with my sewing vlogs like this on Tuesdays and other content out on Fridays, but I post every day on my Instagram, so please go follow me on Instagram. That's at Lady Rebecca Fashions. I also have a link to my Ko-fi account down below if you would like to help support me further in all of my endeavors on this channel. Once again, thank you so, so much for watching. Have a wonderful week, and I will see you very soon in my next video. Happy sewing!